So wrapping up West Africa, we're going to talk about some contemporary arts in West Africa. So in the first area we're going to talk about um, around Ghana, there are um, various varying opportunities for artists. In some places, there have been pretty good um, art schools and an environment for artists to work, and in other places, not so much. Uh, and most of this is the result of imperialism and neo-imperialism. So in Guinea, uh, there's been uh, dictatorships, mostly Western-supported, uh, and quite a bit of instability, um, not much in the way of infrastructure investment. And again, that's kind of forced from the outside, um, from the West, so Europe and the United States, uh, not something that people would do by choice. They would obviously prefer to invest in their own communities and countries. Liberia is an interesting case because we talked about it before and had been founding in the 19th century uh, with the support of the United States. From the 50s until the 80s, uh, they had a lot of economic growth, like a lot of places did around the world. Uh, so as a result, um, they were able to uh, do a lot of spending on infrastructure and education and things that people need. So they had thriving universities. Uh, but since then, uh, and this happens in a lot of places in West Africa with uh, loans from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, uh, some of the... Um, Requirements of these loans force people to pay back the loans uh, instead of spending on infrastructure. So since then, uh, without this spending, there has been a kind of continuous warfare. And part of the warfare has been um, what we talked about before, a result of neo-imperialism, but also a conflict between um, the Americans uh, who had come in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, and the people that have lived in continuously in Liberia. So in Sierra Leone, there was a lot of local uh, workshops. We had talked about the Mende people before. Uh, art institutes and university art education were rare, um, and Freetown is the big city there. So these countries um, along the western coast uh, were the center of the Ebola epidemic. Uh, so some of the um, kind of poverty and lack of infrastructure spending that's a result of neo-imperialism led to um, people not being able to treat the epidemic. Um, since I'm recording this lecture in the beginning of a worldwide pandemic, uh, I think you can kind of understand a little bit better uh, what's going on. So the first artist we're going to talk about is... Abu Bakar Mansouré is only a bit older than me, <laughs> born in 1970. Uh, and this piece is called Terrific, Poisonous, and Hostile. Uh, so Mansouré has an interesting background. He studied science and engineering. And what he thought was fascinating was something that was actually done here at CCS um, in a class with Cheeto Johnson, who some of you may know. Uh, where there were wire machines that were made. So in some of these schools where the kids don't have the resources that they would in wealthier countries, um, they're able to study engineering by making these kind of machines out of freely available wire, so like chicken wire and fencing wire that they would use. Um, pick some of that up and make machines. And Mansouré thought that was like a really good uh, early education. Uh, you know, we prefer to work on things but that are more complicated, but it was a way to start. So he moves to Freetown at about 17. He works as an engineer, um, even though he wasn't uh, formally trained as an engineer, formally trains himself, basically. Um, interested in electronics, as you can see in this piece right here, uh, there's electronics boards with capacitors and such. Uh, those of you who <laughs> have opened up a computer might recognize these sorts of things. And the types of pieces he's making are one of the strands of Afrofuturism. Uh, hopefully later on in the class, we'll be able to talk about ones that um, are a little bit more idealized, which are kind of interesting. Uh, but this one is thinking about the effects of technology and how they could be pretty great and pretty bad at the same time. Uh, if I can find some, I'll include some links so that we can get kind of closer to these pictures so you can zoom in it 
and read everything. Uh, but um, we'll talk about this a little bit later on as we go along. So when you get in close, you can see the circuit boards for this one, a nuclear telephone discovered in the hell. Um, and then you can see he marks each of the pieces. So these are done with pen um, and also bring in kind of like fantastical elements. So uh, Mansoray says, I like doing strange, complicated draw drawings and designing intricate machines inspired by scientific ideas that are times beyond the human imagination. For example, the machines I designed called Hell Extinguisher and Nuclear Telephone discovered in Hell I want people to feel the power of creation. So this one's called Alien Resurrection. You can see, again, it's looking at um, sometimes that technology can be useful and then other ways looking how it can be destructive, uh, which again is looking kind of like forward in time, but also reflective. Uh, to some of his experiences. So unfortunately, he, he had to emigrate to the Netherlands in 1998 um, to escape um, the kind of like violence that he was seeing in Freetown so they can continue to work as an artist. So an interesting quote from Roberta Smith, uh, who is an art critic uh, working for the New York Times. Mr. Mansoray's words and images have a remorseless toxicity. Each work could almost be a hellish opening scene of some apocalyptic nightmare. I'm not sure if that's exactly reflective of the way that Mansoray looks at things. Uh, he sees things that could be nightmarish, but also sees things that could be um, positive. Obviously not the one we're looking at, but some of the previous ones. So this one, one of African black magic, the witch plane, uh, and I'll kind of read the quote on that one. His fascination with mythologies of hell and heaven, as well as extraterrestrial intelligence, explains why he refers to his creations as Julumbo, which means beyond the human brain. Um, so when he's looking at these things, uh, that's why he sometimes includes aliens, looking at things that are um, almost like an evolved or more intelligent organism uh, and how we would interact with those things in ways that could be good, you know, people could get power, but also could be damaging um, to people themselves. So Artists and Academy in Ghana, uh, invention and reinvention within the context of tradition, have been the sustaining forces behind the training provided by universities and art institutes in Ghana. So Ghana was originally called the Gold Coast Colony for obvious reasons, because uh, Westerners were interested in getting as much gold as possible out of um, Africa. So um, Achimoto College uh, in 1928 uh, is one of those interesting kind of like imperialist institutions. Uh, and that sometimes um, these institutions would try their best to squash any sort of um, indigenous types of beliefs, and along with that would go art traditions. But some, um, probably because some of the professors there were thinking a little differently, uh, they had, in this case, parallel education in European and African culture, tribal life, and customs. Uh, so people were able to preserve their culture and their ways of art making. An artist that we're going to talk about, um, El Anatsui, we're going to see how he uses that. So Ghana got their independence, or won their independence, in 1957. And we can see pictured here Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who was the first president, and still considered today to be um, a hero for Africans. Uh, when I teach this class in person, I usually ask, um, I just show the picture, and then I ask, um, do you know who this is? Uh, if we were in Africa, you would all raise your hand. You would know exactly who it was. Uh, but um, you don't in the United States. So he was removed in a coup in 1966. And he believed that at the time, and he has really good reason for believing this, uh, that the CIA was behind the coup. Um, unlike, we're going to talk about um, Patrice Lumumba a little bit uh, in next week or in a couple of weeks, when we talk about Central Africa. And um, the CIA has actually released records uh, for the assassination that they were involved with um, in Patrice Lumumba. They haven't re released records uh, with Kwame Nkrumah, 
Uh, but Nakumra, because of the environment uh, in this area and because of the type of politician he was, he was a social democrat like, um, like Bernie Sanders in, in modern America. Uh, and the United States doesn't like that. Um, they wanted to have people that they could um, control and that would continue the flow of resources out of Africa uh, to the West. So after Nakumra, uh, the US and Europe got what they want, wanted, uh, new governments that followed World Bank and IMF have austerity measures to pay off debt. Uh, so the World Bank and the IMF, they give um, loans to um, African countries, uh, but they require the African countries to keep a certain amount of capital and reserve uh, to be able to get these loans, and then they require them to pay the loans, and austerity means um, they're not putting money back into the people. So um, Kwame Nkrumah, he's a social democrat, so he wanted to put money into education, infrastructure, uh, all of the things that people want and need and are very popular throughout the world. Austerity means you don't put money into those things. Everything goes into paying back the loans. So these loans have become, over time, um, basically um, loans that are, uh, when they're made, they're more uh, a political purpose. Um, so they're trying to get um, the resources out of Africa as quickly as possible. So NUST uh, is the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, and the artist we're gonna look at, um, Ella Natsui, uh, was trained there. So some of the social democratic measures that Nkrumah had, was able to institute um, continued, uh, but again, in recent times, because of austerity, we're seeing a lack of investment. And if, it, if you've never heard that term austerity before, just as a side note, it's something that um, by the 80s was going on all around the world, including wealth, wealthy countries. Um, so austerity is what you see in modern European countries uh, for the same reason to pay off debt, like in Greece and in Spain, uh, but also in the United States, which has basically been um, in a state of austerity for uh, the last few decades. So pan-Africanism, uh, which Nakumra would be part of, uh, is the idea of collaborating with other African states to share tech and culture and unite against Western imperialism and neo-imperialism. So pan-Africanism is cultural, so it's about arts, uh, as we had seen before, uh, but it's also political. Uh, Africans who are, again, you know, many um, hundreds of cultures, uh, see a kind of um, common goal uh, in fighting against Western imperialism and neo-imperialism uh, and being able to liberate themselves. So Nakumra would also be called a nationalist. And something that might be cool to go over on the extra credit board is what's the difference between Nakumra's nationalism and the type of nationalism you would see like from President Trump or from uh, a white nationalist or something like that. So if you wanna discuss that, uh, I think that would be a really good thing to discuss and think about what nationalism means in the, con in the context of a people who are, um, have been uh, colonized. So Samuel Faso and his African Spirit series uh, included Nakumra. And you can see that Nakumra in this picture, uh, it was not his taste until be he became the president, but he's wearing uh, a kente cloth. Uh, he wanted to show um, that, yes, he was a new uh, type of politician, uh, but also that he had one foot in traditions. So Ella Natsui, uh, who's still alive today, um, is one of the more interesting artists uh, that's come out of this particular area. And his early work we're looking at with conspirators um, is was done with power tools. So he's a graduate of NUST. Uh, he moved to Nigeria from Ghana, where he lives today. And his idea in his early work uh, is he wanted to deliberately to violate the conservative canons of wood carving. So he learned traditional techniques. Uh, he learned um, contemporary techniques for wood carving. Uh, and he wanted to go into kind of a different direction to see what would happen. So using things like power tools. And um, in this, Young says woods of different colors to represent the diversity of African cultures while the violence of the chainsaw enacted the ruptures imposed by European imperialist expansion. 
Uh, so Alan Itsui, uh, he definitely has political content, and I'm going to include links to a video where you can see him talk about those sort of things. Uh, but at the same time, he wants to give uh, viewers uh, and people that are consuming the art uh, their own experience as well. Uh, so he says that artists are not dictators. So to go along with this, um, the actual elements of this piece uh, can be rearranged. And he often does this with his work. So with conspirators, he may take it to another place, uh, you know, either a gallery or a museum, rearrange it and give it a different name. Uh, so to him, uh, when he completes a piece, it's not necessarily completed. There's things that can happen um, as he travels from place to place uh, that could make the piece have a different meaning. Uh, and when he's helping people set up exhibitions of his own work, uh, he'll kind of work on the fly and respond to what he's seeing around him and even change the names of his pieces. Uh, and again, one of the videos I'm going to show you the link, he'll talk about names uh, and words and language and how the precision of these things uh, can sometimes work against the art, but also that in some languages there are words where they have multiple um, multiple sounds or multiple words for the same spelling of a word uh, that allows um, a piece to have greater or varying meanings. So his themes and his work, uh, and, and this comes straight from him, are destruction and reconstitution of materials as metaphors for life, experience, and changes in Africa under colonialism and since independence. Uh, we'll get that into more detail with that in a moment. Textiles and traditional African crafts. You'll see how he relates some of his work to these. Uh, concern over Western scholars' misinterpretation of African history and the distortions that it has caused. Uh, so we see that in the work itself and the titles, uh, but you'll also see him talk about these types of ideas in um, the videos that I'm gonna post for you. Uh, so this is very important because when people think about history, it's one of the most important things for people to own. Uh, and Western scholars in, are interpreting African history in a way, whether they know it or not, uh, that had, tends to provide justification for colonization and imperialism. Uh, so it is a very important goal of Pan-Africanists and African nationalists to um, correct these misinterpretations and take back their own history for themselves. Uh, it's always part of a libertarian movement. Uh, one phrase uh, that is used to describe this process is decolonization. So when people are talking about decolonization movements, this is part of it, um, taking back your history and defining it in a way that is useful for you. So this piece, Gravity and Grace, and again, when you look at these um, in the video, one of the videos I'm going to show you, you'll see how these pieces are made. But when they're actually like displayed, when they're put into the exhibition, when they're installed, uh, they are installed in different ways. And when they are, they take on new meanings. So he incorporates recycled materials. And these pieces are huge, by the way. Um, there's one at the DIA that was recently acquired. Uh, and it's in the big, big um, kind of vaulted ceiling area in the middle of the museum because the base can't put it anywhere else. It's so big. So when you looked at some of these pieces, uh, and in the video it'll show you the technique, uh, it's, he didn't think of it as textiles necessarily, or as specific textiles, but after he completed some, he said, wow, these are, they kind of resemble the kente cloth, you can see in the picture here, a couple of kente cloth being worn, and so he called this piece Old Man's Cloth, and he realized that, um, kind of unknowingly, he was uh, recalling some of the traditional textile work of Ghana, like we had talked about before. So in this one, um, sorry, move the pieces out of the way a little bit. They would have been laid flat during its construction, it's contorted and manipulated during installation. Uh, so in the video, it'll show how the pieces are made. He has a big crew of people, um, all men, uh, making these because remember in Ghana, um, men make the textiles, so he's got all of these young men working for him. 
uh, and that's what a lot of uh, modern artists do. So in this particular piece, we see flattened liquor bottle labels and caps um, and using recycled materials that we talked about, but also um, in kind of challenging this idea of a distinction between art and craft. We talked about this earlier in class, like sometimes craft is used dismissively. It's talking about a work of art that's made, but doesn't have a philosophical basis behind it. Whereas art would be something with this philosophical and intellectual basis. So he wants to destroy that, um, that so-called distinction because it's not something that really makes sense as, as we've seen uh, in the African cultures we've studied. Uh, these, there is a continuity between things that people make uh, in their philosophical beliefs, uh, and this type of distinction um, doesn't really have much of a meaning. So to get a little bit into the meaning of this piece, um, alcohol is one of the commodities bought with Europeans to exchange for goods in Africa. Uh, eventually, alcohol became one of the items used in the transatlantic slave trade. They made rum in the West Indies, took it to Liverpool, and then made its way back to Africa. I thought that the bottle caps had a strong reference to the history of Africa. Uh, so he's talking about the trade uh, with uh, molasses and, and, um, and rum uh, with slaves uh, that build up uh, with the Americas and um, the relationships, you know, historically, but also in modern times. Uh, looking at liquor as something that can be good, but also destructive uh, in modern times to communities. Uh, so kind of a symbol of imperialism. So Anatsui tends to use poetic and evocative titles for his works that open a range of possible interpretations, while also inviting an emotional response. He is interested in provoking thought, but not in providing answers. And I think that's a pretty accurate way of looking at his work uh, when you see the videos, see him talk about it himself. Another possible reference is these liquor caps. Some of them have this golden um, sheen to them, uh, so it also represents the history of this area as the Gold Coast. This is my obligatory <laughs> person standing in front of an artwork. <laughs> if you're, I've known people that have worked for um, kind of art websites, and they're always expected to produce pictures like this whenever for articles. So uh, this one's called Earth's Skin, uh, which is interesting kind of layered meaning. Uh, Brooklyn Museums, and it was part of his solo show, Gravity and Grace, Monumental Works by Elan Itsui. Uh, pretty much all of his works are monumental, meaning um, huge and with meaning. Uh, so in the exhibition notes, they talk about how he has a nomadic aesthetic, a non-fixed form. So I'd mentioned before, every time this piece is displayed, he might take the same materials, uh, and display it in a different way and let it take on a new meaning, complete with a new title. Uh, so uh, this is something that's very important to him. In one of the videos I'm gonna show you uh, that I'll that'll link in the comment section, he'll talk about fixity and non-fixity, and he'll talk about how it works in his native language uh, and why he uses certain words uh, to um, describe some of his pieces. Uh, so uh, I'll include the links to two videos. One will show his how he works uh, with the studio in Nigeria. And then the other one will be more philosophical and he'll talk about his work and what it could mean. Uh, so watch those two videos and if you have comments on them, uh, put them in the extra credit board. So uh, with Kofi, I'm not gonna pronounce his last name. He calls himself Kofi anyways. Uh, so I'm gonna just start with that. He had trained at the Ganada Art Institute. And um, with his works, uh, I'm gonna show you one of the examples of, of his works in a minute. But check out this video, again, which I'll include in the comments for the comment section, or the um, description for this particular video. And um, it's about 12 minutes long, and he'll talk about a lot of things. He'll talk about uh, his relationship with uh, his art in the world, uh, I'll talk about things where he'll say that, you know, only he can produce things in a particular time that he produces it, uh, which is one of those things where um, once you kind of think about it, uh, it has uh, quite profound meaning. Um, and he'll talk about um, what it means to be an artist 
the difference between the work he does for clients and the work that he does for himself. Uh, and I'll also talk about the content of some of his work, uh, talking about politicians, economics, uh, and other issues along those lines. So I was kind of like, I found it remarkable that with Kofi and with Anatsui, a lot of things they talk about reminds me of some of my study in Zen Buddhism. Actually, a student write um, a paper about Zen and Kofi. Uh, and you'll kind of see that some of the relationships between people and the world uh, has a lot of overlap um, with the way that Zen Buddhists look at the relationship between the ego uh, and the world around us. Uh, so I think you'll find that interesting. But let's check out one of his art pieces. So this one's called The Scars of Memory, and it was inspired by the Rwandan genocide in 1994. <clears throat> so I'm going to summarize the Rwandan genocide in just a few minutes, which is very difficult to do. Um, that's why I'm kind of like chuckling a little bit. It's not something you can summarize very quickly, uh, but I'll try my best. Um, so there's kind of a long buildup uh, to leading up to the genocide in 1994. Uh, so in Rwanda, they have something, and we, we kind of talked about this before, where uh, with the Fulani where people's jobs um, basically become an ethnicity over time. Um, but in Rwanda, like in other places, um, the ethnicities don't necessarily see themselves as having a certain job, and that means that they have elite status. So there was um, two different um, peoples. Uh, there was um, the Hutu peoples and... So the Hutu peoples and the Tutsi people. So the Hutu uh, were the agriculturalists and the Tutsis were um, the basket weavers. Um, and pre-colonial, there wasn't necessarily a conflict between these two groups. Uh, the Tutsi was always like a smaller group uh, for obvious reasons. You usually need more people working in agriculture, uh, but there wasn't necessarily a con conflict. Um, so when um, imperialists came in, they found it useful to um, kind of create a conflict, uh, and they gave special privileges to the Tutsis. Uh, so in colonial governments, the Tutsis had quite a bit of power, which, as you might imagine, Hutus would be resentful of. So after independence, uh, we see the, this um, kind of conflict boil over over time. Uh, and the Tutsis, uh, who had been collaborating um, with Western um, favored governments uh, in neighboring countries, and then got involved with wars, um, uh, basically on the side of uh, the Westerners, um, started to um, see uh, the Hutus as being um, against their best interests, uh, and they began to um, randomly kill Hutu people. And over time, um, and the numbers of Hutu that were killed uh, by Tutsis is unknown. Uh, it could be in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, but eventually, the Hutus uh, came into power, uh, deposed the Tutsis, and then began um, a genocide uh, in kind of revenge the other side. Uh, and killed, again, hundreds of thousands, perhaps a million uh, Tutsis. And this genocide, um, when it came from the Hutus, uh, they did it in a way where regular people uh, were committing a lot of the killings. So they had this massive kind of propaganda pr um, campaign on the radio uh, where they're talking about um, Tutsis and about how they're subhuman and people should go out from house to house and kill them. Um, and some men would do it. So the story I'm telling you is a little bit different than the narrative that's become popular in the West. When it was reported on in the West, at first it was, it was basically ignored, but when it was reported on, it was basically accurate. They talked about the Tutsis killing Hutu, uh, and then the response of Hutus killing Tutsis. Uh, but since the genocide, and since the Tutsis returned to power, uh, and since the Tutsis are um, very kind to um, Western interests, um, the story of the genocide has become 
Tutsis were killing Hutus, and that was it. Um, but there's been a lot of work to kind of like rescue the actual narrative. Uh, and some of it's done by um, scholars at Michigan State. Uh, and they have seen, um, they have taken demographic data and shown that, yes, indeed, there was um, Hutus that were ma massive killings of Hutus um, before uh, the genocide of the Hutus against the Tutsis. Uh, so this um, particular event uh, throughout Africa um, was seen as something that was horrific, uh, and many people throughout Africa wanted to help Rwanda, uh, and that's what Kofi is trying to do with the Scars of Memory. And he's kind of doing it in a pan-Africanist way, and he's relating multiple cultures, uh, including his own, to these particular pieces. So we can see that it's an installation, uh, it's a bunch of faces and dirt representing the mass graves of the genocide. Uh, but it's also related to, um, and normally I talk about this class, but I took it out so we could have a little bit of, uh, uh, make this part a little bit quicker, are these particular ceramic pieces um, in Ghana that are made, uh, some of them are stone, some of them are ceramic, and they were made in ancient times. Uh, and the modern Akan people don't know exactly what it was for, uh, but they th guess that it has some side of a, spiritual or memorial purpose. Uh, so they've been keeping these ancient pieces uh, in their places. So the materials, the scope, and the imagery of genocide all recall a Khan groves filled with memorial terracottas. Uh, so a kind of unknown memorial. Uh, and it allows the Khan ancestors to lend their dignity to the dead of a distant African nation. Uh, so again, kind of a pan-Africanism uh, in this particular piece. So the last artist I'm going to talk about is Cyprian Toka Dagba, uh, and this is a photo of him. Um, and he is kind of like some of the other artists we had talked about before, uh, like Mazgabu, um, in that he's making artists art for spiritual purposes, and then outsiders, collectors saw it and they thought this is pretty cool. Uh, I want to, you know, I want to buy this. So he originally made work for Vodan shrines. Vodan are the gods of the Yoruba and the Fan. And remember, there's like tens of thousands and hundreds, hundreds of thousands of them, uh, which is great for artists. Um, and these shrines would be made for a spiritual purpose, uh, and they would have the images themselves would have power, uh, and they would have meaning to the people that um, are visiting these shrines. To give you an idea kind of how artists like this are treated, uh, remember when I talked about Mazgabu, I couldn't find any interviews with him. Uh, and that's kind of the case what you see with Tokudagba. Um, he was included in the Magicians de la Terre exhibition in 1989. And even the name of that particular exhibition uh, is a problem and racist in itself. Uh, it means magicians of the earth, uh, giving this idea that um, Africans are these people that are uniquely connected to the earth, uh, which serves this very Orientalist way of looking at Africans um, as people who are kind of stuck and not progressive and kind of going in circles. Uh, and that way you can use it to justify imperialism. You know, we're not, you know, colonizing them so we can take all their resources, but we're civilizing these people. So to see that in a French exhibition at the Pompidou Center, in the title in 1989 just shows the, um, the long-term effects of the way that Europeans look at Africans. Uh, and I'll talk about this exhibit uh, again a little bit later on. So he had originally made these pieces for shrines, but then um, found out collectors were one of them. So he created these decorations on canvas for collectors. Didn't see them as particularly powerful, but you know, some of was a way to make some money off of some Westerners. So these pieces, um, in this one, uh, sorry, move this out of the way. Uh, Dongbi Aedowedo, uh, body encircles the earth to hold it up. So it's kind of like serpent in the rainbow image uh, is very popular uh, in the Yoruba and the image made its way to the Americas as well. Uh, if you think of religions like um, voodoo, Voodoo religion is basically Yoruba religion mixed with Christianity. 
uh, and this image made its way over there. There was even this, um, speaking of Orientalism, a very kind of like racist movie called The Serpent in the Rainbow set in Haiti. Uh, and, you know, it kind of uses this image as the title. Um, so Vasona says, and, and she's pretty good in this part, uh, immediately recognizable on the walls of a shrine, same image seems exotic, mysterious, even surreal in a European gallery. Uh, so you can kind of see this like Western interest in exoticizing uh, African people. They don't really care what the image means. They just look at it and see it as strange and different, and they want to possess that strangeness and, and difference. Uh, and again, even in modern times, that's the kind of like leftovers um, from imperialism and colonization. Uh, and something that if you're taking a class like this, I hope you can... Um, kind of disassemble over time. So this particular piece, I'll read the description of it. Oops, let's go back one. So in the beginning, there was a vast serpent whose body formed 7,000 coils beneath the earth, protecting him from the descent into the abysmal sea. Then the titanic snake began to move and heave its massive form uh, from the earth to envelop the sky. It scattered stars in the firmament and wound its tight flesh down the mountains to create riverbeds. It shot thunderbolts to the earth to create sacred thunderstones. From its deepest core, I released the sacred waters to fill the earth with life. As the first rains fell, a rainbow encompassed the sky, and Dembala took her, Avita Weto, as his wife. The spiritual nectar that creates reproduces through all men and women as milk and semen. The serpent and the rainbow taught humankind a link between blood and life, between menstruation and birth, and the ultimate voodoo sacrament of blood sacrifice. Uh, so I wanted to read this story because it shows a lot of elements that we've seen in African cultures. Uh, first, this like kind of contrasting elements, making a whole. Um, so milk and semen, blood and life, menstruation um, and birth. Uh, you need to have both of these men and women uh, to be able to create a whole uh, showing um, the relationship between uh, ancient ancestors and modern life. Um, and um, perhaps explaining why you have things like blood sacrifice or other types of rituals in Vodan and Voodoo. So let's bring this back up again. So some of the pieces I was able to find descriptions of, but other ones, um, Togodaba is using images that, you know, may be kind of like a secret, so you can't always find them. Uh, and again, because um, artists like this are tend to be as sadicized, you don't hear a lot from the artists themselves. Uh, so this one, Behan Zan, was the 11th king of Dahomey. Uh, and he fought the French and lost, uh, but he was seen as a hero, um, an anti-imperialist hero. And he was the last king of the Dahomey. Uh, we'll bring them up again when we talk about um, Black American art. So in it, we have a few elements that are iconography. The gun shows that he fought. Uh, the shark and the egg are a rebus of his name. Uh, so look at that word rebus if you don't remember our discussion of it when we talked about Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, and, you know, this image kind of has some power to it. So this one, um, I wasn't able to find a description of it. So some of these are representing uh, Arisha, uh, ones that may have been created nearby, Tokodagba, so you can't always find um, the meaning behind the images that he creates. This one, um, Tokodagba, thus serves to remind us of how shifts in the context of an African art can completely transform the ways in which it's perceived. So again, uh, Westerners would see this graphic style and this unknown um, iconography and say, wow, this is like, um, comes from these other exotic people on the other side of the world, uh, but it's not used in this way in Vodun uh, these images have power, and it's power that can be wielded by certain people. Uh, so um, transformed uh, when he's making these pieces. This is not to criticize Toko Dagba. Um, you got to get paid, uh, and getting paid from Westerners is, is uh, definitely a little bit of sweet justice. 